Recording in progress. Good evening, thanks for coming out. This is a, we're gonna open this as a select board hearing. So you'll hear us go through some motions and whatnot, and then we'll get to the actual police services committee presentation. And then we'll open it up for comments, statements, questions from folks from there. So with that, we'll call the select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. And this is comment about anything not on the agenda. And just so we're clear, the Police Services Committee presentation would not come up under this item. Not seeing anything only to approve the agenda. We move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Next up is new business. And with that, we'll ask the, the, we'll do the Police Services Committee public forum. And we're going to start out with Peter uh, Nowlin, who is our moderator, and he'll move it along and we'll give a little presentation after that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Peter Nowlin, and I have been asked to moderate the public forum. Is everybody hearing me? The public forum tonight. Uh, the public forum is an opportunity for the uh, citizens of Randolph to listen to the presentation for what the police committee has done so far and to provide public comment and ask questions with regard to that uh, presentation. It's the, this meeting is a hybrid form. We have both the in-person and we are uh, doing it virtually. Uh, for some of you who don't know me, I am at the absolute leading edge of baby boomers. So, so if I fumble a couple of times on the, on the virtual, please forgive me. We'll do the best we can, and we'll try, try and make sure everyone has an opportunity. The, uh, we're going to start with a presentation made by uh, the Police Services Committee, and then I'll open it up for... Uh, discussion, comments, questions. The format that I'm going to use is uh, to recognize people in the hall first, and each person has one opportunity to speak, and then when we're through with that, we're going to recognize all the people that are attending virtually, so that I don't have to kind of crane my head jumping back and forth. We are asking each person to uh, speak in simple, direct terms, whether asking a question or making a comment. My experience is you're far more persuasive when you speak directly, simply, and with respect and dignity. There is opportunity, there is strong disagreement and strong opinions on the subject, but again, you are more persuasive if you express yourself in simple direct sentences and with respect and dignity. With that, I will turn it over to Kristen Chandler, who is going to make the presentation. All right. And thank you. Thank you, Peter. From the beginning? Yeah. You want to go backwards? I don't want to go backwards. Well, welcome, everybody, while we're getting this set up. I am Kristen Chandler, a member of the Police Services Committee. We're just gonna run through um, a little this slideshow and uh, then Peter's gonna handle your, or call on you for your comments. Um, this is sort of what you can expect from the slideshow. We'll tell you about the committee makeup, our process, what data we generated, what options we have come up with initially. And please remember, we're not making any decisions tonight. The tonight is really an opportunity to hear from you and what your concerns are. Um, we're going to talk about the fiscal impact of these options that we've um, mulled over and get uh, your uh, input. So I'm just going to ask the members to stand up as we go through. You know, Trini Broussard has just uh, opened the select board meeting. She was the chair of our committee. Um, Judy Powell is the vice chair. I'm Kristen Chandler. <coughs> Sheila Jacobs. Stephanie Tyler was a select board representative. Neil Richardson. And Joe Voci. All right, so our purposes um, 
really came from um, a lot of select board meetings before we even were formed as a committee. And the purpose really is to define the needs for policing services in our current police district and outside the district and the best manner in which to provide those and to meet those needs and how to fund them. We're also looking at the current articles of merger and figuring out what legal options we have to determine what the best path forward is. Our process so far has been, we've met 10 times since uh, mid-July. We invited uh, business members of the community to hear what their concerns were. So we had representatives from the barn, from Shaw's, from VTC, or I should say, I'm sorry, Vermont State College's Randolph campus, uh, Gifford Hospital, Clara Martin Center, and the uh, OSSU. We also heard from Safeline as well. And if, for those of you who don't know, that's the domestic violence agency that serves our town. We had an opportunity for public comment at every meeting, and the police chief and the town manager were present at every meeting. So what we did initially is we re reviewed potential budgets. We reviewed a lot of data that was provided by both the Randolph Police and by the Vermont State Police uh, Royalton Barracks. We reviewed, um, we had a really uh, interesting spreadsheet with other towns of similar size and population, we looked at their police budgets, their staffing makeup, their equipment that they had, whether they had um, an embedded mental health worker or other type of supportive services like community service officers or community service liaisons or any other resources that similar towns and population had. We looked at the monthly police logs for all calls that Randolph PD handled within the district. We also looked at calls they had to handle outside of the district because either uh, v, uh, VSP was not available or that VSP requested that Randolph respond because they weren't available. And when I say not available, I don't mean they, they're not around. They're here and uh, in fact, the lieutenant from the barracks is here tonight, but um, just that because of staffing, as you may have heard, um, it was very difficult at, at some points, depending on what was going on in the day or the night for the Vermont State Police to respond to what they could have. And also we looked at data that uh, the State Police responded to within our town when we were not available. So we had um, uh, hours of operation that um, are not 24 seven. And so there would be times in the middle of the night maybe when the Vermont State Police might respond. So right now, your Randolph police respond to everything from traffic violations to very serious felonies. They are really reactive as opposed to being doing proactive policing at this point. Uh, as I said before, uh, VSP Royalton can't always respond because of either call volume or staffing requirements. Um, they have a very large uh, jurisdiction to cover. And um, just as an example, there may be three troopers on, two of them may be involved in a domestic in Chelsea. And if something happens here, um, Hello? you can't just send one person, they may have to send more than one, and that would delay the response. Um, what we learned. We learned that the current model uh, with staffing is not sustainable. Right now we have four full-time employees. We have the chief, we have an administrator, a dispatcher. From eight to four, Monday through Friday. Mary City provides dispatch after four on weekends. We have uh, two full-time uh, officers. And we've got two part-time employees who are covering shifts from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Currently, the dispatcher works eight to four, Monday to Friday, and Barry City provides dispatch after four and on weekends for us, for Randolph. Our current equipment, we have three cruisers, two of which will need to be replaced next year. Everybody's issued a duty weapon, portable radios that uh, were required used, ballistic vests, and body cameras. What else we learned? Not every call to the police requires a police response, but we don't keep that data. And uh, try as we might, it's hard to figure out how to keep that data, where there may be a call where once there, the police could determine, well, actually, 
this probably could be handled by um, a social worker or uh, maybe a mental health crisis worker or maybe a, a community support person. Somebody other than uh, an armed response. Um, and I'm sure you can think about some of what some of those, you know, police are not required for every, every response. But right now our system is, if we have an emergency, we pretty much either call 911 or 988 if it's a mental health emergency. We talked about, so therefore we talked about alternatives to police response and whether we could uh, provide for that. So we specifically talked about a mental health clinician or a social worker who could be embedded with the police. Um, I, if you don't know, every barracks, Vermont State Police barracks in Vermont has an embedded mental health worker who is an employee of a mental health agency, except for our barracks in Royalton. Um, they have been unable to find somebody to stay in that position. It's, it takes the right person, so lots of different reasons for why they haven't, the funding is there, they're just still looking for the right person. Um, we can, and, and there's a lot that could be said about that, but I'll leave it at that. We did talk about whether if we got, got had a position like that, if we could share it with another town or maybe with the college or some other entity so that uh, it was a, sort of a half-time, half-time thing. Some uh, municipal departments in Vermont currently do that, like for example, Barrie and Montpelier, they share one embedded mental health worker. Uh, she right now works two days in Montpelier, three days in Barrie, and then the next week she switches three days in Montpelier, two days in Barrie, just as an example. Not every um, municipality that has an embedded mental health worker has them work nine to five because mental health calls happen at different, they tend to happen later in the day. So some places have them work uh, later in the day as a shift. But they're all um, funded through the Department of Mental Health and through their mental health agencies at a, a full-time position. We're the only county in Vermont without a Turning Point Center, which is a center that uh, provides recovery coaches and substance use recovery. Uh, services for people um, with substance use issues. And as I said before, we're the only barracks without um, an embedded mental health worker. So what we learned from our guests, rather than run through what everybody told us from all those business entities I told you about, uh, they all rely on Randolph Police in some capacity. So what are our options? Options would be to continue with Randolph Police within our current district boundaries. We could continue with Randolph Police with an expanded district that we uh, have looked at lots of different options, but what we're proposing is for option two for us all to consider is running up the east of routes, uh, up to the east, up Route 66 to the intersection with Ridge Road and East Bethel Road right up here, so that the barn would be covered within that jurisdiction and then south down to Beanville Road to Route 12 and south down Route 12 to the town line. And we have a map that we'll show you in just a sec. The third option is to continue with Randolph Police with an expanded district to include all of Randolph Town. And now Trevor, I believe, is gonna talk about the budgets, the draft budgets for all three options. Right, with the person, yeah, whatever that was. Okay. Yeah. I think the rest is all you, right? <laughs> you believe? Luckily. Okay. So mm -hmm. we're going to just run you through these. As Kristen mentioned, there were the three options the committee's considering. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I want to stress that each one of these is a draft. So at some point, as either the committee or the select board starts to zero in on one of the options, or more than one, I suppose, there will be some further refinement of these numbers. They are all what I would say is turnkey meaning if that was the budget, we could operate that police model um, for fiscal year 25 in an effective and sustainable way. So this one just tries to take you from left to right from where we landed in 24 with what was approved through the 25 existing district, 25 expanded, and 25 townwide. So at the bottom, I just want to note, and you'll see this on a couple of slides, these are operating budgets. We do have capital reserve transfers in all of them, but it, as you scale up and out, we have vehicle needs and building needs um, that are gonna have to be factored in that have costs. We'll talk a little bit about the cost of vehicles. Obviously the building one, nobody knows that one yet. Um, 
because it depends on size, site, and all of that stuff. So the main difference between all of those drafts and even the 24 one, it's staffing. What this chart just tries to lay out is where we are, which is this top line in terms of full-time officers, part-time capacity, and then goes through each of the options that's being considered at this point. So they scale up by about two full-time certified law enforcement officers each. Um, we've been looking for level three certified officers. We've hired a level two and put them through the academy. Um, and so we're certainly willing to do that as well. The idea being that at level three, they're the most sort of flexible and valuable to us in that there aren't any limitations on their law enforcement capacities. So just to run you through why some of those staffing numbers add up as quickly as they do, an all-in cost for an officer is between $100,000 and $125,000 per year. This includes everything from health insurance, retirement, all the other benefits. Um, the biggest variable is health insurance. We run you through some of these here. Everybody in the budget is, we've tried to budget conservatively. Um, so there are, is a mixture of plans in there. A single plan we think is going to clock in around $12,000, just a little less than that, in fiscal 25. Then you go up to a family plan, you're talking about a $33,000, give or take. That's the town share. The employees all kick in 15% of the premium cost. So it's, that's our, just our share there. It's not mentioned in this slide, but retirement is a big cost for us. We're in the state employees retirement system, so our employer contribution is 21% and change. On the municipal end, those are closer to 10% or less, depending on the pool you're in. Uh, equipment's about $3,300 per officer, training $1,500, and then the vehicles that I mentioned on the last slide, to fully equip them and have them ready to roll, we're thinking is between sixty dollars and $65,000. We have two that are close to the end of their useful life, and so regardless of model, we're going to have to think pretty hard on how to get those replaced. Um, useful life, best practices that we'd like to get to would be about three years per cop car, given the continuous use. As the committee has heard me describe them, it's like having pet sharks. So they, you want them to move all the time. So this is option one, the existing district, and we just broke it down into categories here. Uh, on this side here, my left probably, yep, yours as well. Um, we have the three primary categories of revenue. Um, property taxes are the bulk of that. And we uh, come up with that number by essentially subtracting these other two from this operating number. And that's the amount to be raised. On the administrative end, the administrative category, those are all those personnel costs we just talked about briefly. The operating is everything else, so that's fuel, dispatch, weapons, equipment, uniforms, um, property and in, in liability insurances, those pieces. And then the other is where those capital reserve transfers are. So in this model, we've got the chief, four full-time patrol officers, so that gives us five full-time certified law enforcement officers, one admin dispatch, and we've got three part-time officers. Um, this is a much reduced hour load. It's a little less than 500 hours per year for that total pool um, at this point in the drafts. We've got the three vehicles, but like I've mentioned, two of them are probably up for replacement. There is the potential for us to contract out our services with other municipalities. We know some of our neighbors have been interested. Obviously, size matters in terms of how much you could take on and what you could do. We're planning to go for a federal COPS grant when they open up again in the spring. They're now a May only. Um, application period. We can keep using the existing facility, replete with historic charm as I sell it to Scott every time. Um, he comes in and out of there. And I'd mention what the other expenditure category uh, includes. At the bottom, and this is just so you have a frame of reference, we took the last year of the Randolph PD, ran it through essentially um, between fiscal 19 and fiscal 25, what that number would be if you just increase, increased it by inflation. And the number we used is what they call essentially CPI for local government. It gets really wonky from there. Legislative Joint Fiscal Office uses this in their fiscal facts. So we put it in there. It's anywhere from 1% change to I think one year was closer to 8%. But that's what you come up with as a number, 756, 720. We started last year around 771. And as you can see, this one, in large part because of those insurance and other costs, is currently at, at the 856. So it just gives you a little context from where we ended to where we are now. The second option is the expanding expanded district. Kristen described it to you. We tried to draw it on a map using our GIS system for property mapping. These all follow property boundaries, which is why it's got this unique shape. 
to it as you go out. And this is the section that comes up toward where we are now. And this is the Beanville section. This is roughly the railroad tracks in terms of this border and then the property borders there. So that's where that draft of what an expanded district looks like is now. So that budget scales up again. Um, you can see same categories here. We got six full-time patrol officers plus the chief to make seven, same admin dispatch, same part-time officer footprint. But now we're up into the need for four to five vehicles. So the two we've got to replace plus another one to two. We can contract a little bit more with other services. Um, we're still factoring in that federal crops grant. And we think we could probably still get away with the existing facility for a little bit while we plan for what the long-term option would be. It's probably not viable long-term due to its size. And then the town-wide district is the third model. Again, we scale up again. Now we're talking eight full-time patrol officers, same footprint for everybody else. Now we know we need at least six vehicles. Um, we can certainly do even more expanded options for service contracts, so Brookfield, Braintree, if they were interested, um, those types of things, in addition to any site-specific contracts that might be out there, project site stuff. Still the federal cramp, cops grant in there, um, but at this point, the existing facility can't be used. So we're going to need at least a short-term option and then a long-term one for that. Of the three, in terms of which one would be ready to roll, most likely on July 1, they're all a bit of a challenge in large part. You've got to go out and find those cops um, and or put them through the academy. This one's probably the farthest away just because you have the number of officers, you have the vehicle question, you have the building question. There's a lot of mechanical stuff that goes into this one. But if this is the one that advances through, through the committee's process and the boards, um, some of those details get worked out along the way. So this is a very, I want to start with the caveats on this. We're using grantless values as last filed. Every rate you see here when we hit August, none of these will be the same. We want them close. The reason is because we're going through a townwide reappraisal the first time in 14 years, I think it was, something like that. So the grantless value is going to change. These rates are going to change. These are based on the ones that we last filed with the state. So just with that sort of first caveat. The expanding district one is also a very rough metric. We took the values in those parcel boundaries, added them up, took 1% of that. That becomes the grand list for that. There might be other factors that move that number, but it at least gives you, these all are attempted to give you order of magnitude. Nobody should make their own financial plans on any of these. They're just estimates so that we have something to start talking about and to look at. You can see as you move from left to right, we go from current to existing. These are meant to be sort of the total tax bills on a $250,000 property. Obviously, if your property is valued at more or less than that, your individual impact would change. Obviously, no change from the current one. Everybody's already in there. So if we did the existing model, who pays and how much, I should note that in all of these here, that general fund payment for service that was introduced last year, stays at the $100,000 in all of these models that it's been at. When you get to the town-wide and everybody pays in that model, you can see the total for the year for that property is estimated here, and then the change from current here. And we just tried to show you what the rates would be. This is essentially the outside the district rate, so that $100,000 that everybody pays minus about $4,000 in projected fine and speed enforcement revenue. And that's how you get to about what that dollar amount is on that grant list. So with all of those caveats, they're there just to show you the order of magnitude. Um, and give you a sense of where these budgets land if everything stays more or less the same as it is today, knowing that that's probably not going to be the case. And so that's the end of, of those. We'll have this available. I'll just stop sharing so we can see everybody in the room. But at any point, you need to pull that back up. It's right there. Okay, we're already at my first adjustment. This is the only microphone. So we're going to play past the baton a lot today. Uh, the Police Services Committee is moving up to face you so they can understand your comments and questions better and respond. I am going to move down front so that uh, when a question is asked, we can pass the microphone if it needs to be 
or I can pass it to whoever's responding. I will try and make it go, go more smoothly. I please request that each of you who stand up to ask a question identify yourself so that we will have a record of who's asking what. I remind you that we're going to go through the questions in the room first, and then we'll go to the virtual, one, one question per person or one comment per person, to try and allow everyone an opportunity to speak. And I remind you to make your questions simple and direct for a couple of reasons. It's more persuasive, and with one mic, I might have to, re to, uh, to repeat it for everyone. So please help me out on that. And let's be dignified and respectful in all of our comments so you can be more persuasive. With that, who wants to go first with a question or comment or uh, provide input? Yes, in the back. Um, Milo Cutler. I, just a technical thing to clarify with the expanded district. It's you're describing it as to down to the Ridge Road. The Ridge Road actually doesn't start till a half mile north of where you have that. That is still Route 66 all the way down to where our house is. So it's really the stop sign at BTC. So you might want to just change the wording in that so there's no confusion publicly about how far, because when we saw that, we thought, oh, it goes all the way down to our house, and uh, it doesn't. So the comment <laughs> is that uh, and Milo Cutler lives at the intersection of Ridge Road and Route 66, which is where uh, Route 66 is going north from BTC and turns right to go down the hill. And her comment, and I think that was correct, that the proposed expanded district does not extend all the way to Ridge Road. It's, it really goes to the intersection. Is that correct? Correct. To the that entrance correct? to uh, yes. Vermont okay. University, whatever it's called. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yes. Hi. Okay. So my name is Alexis Miller. Uh, I moved to Randolph at the end of August. Um, I'm wondering to Vermont three years ago from Washington, D.C. I lived in Burlington, Colchester. I moved to Randolph because the crime rates are so low, um, you know, like kids, you know, ride around the bikes, there's, you know, the property crime rates are low, there's like zero murders. You know. So why are we expanding the forest? The question, Alexis Miller? Yes. Was, uh, she, she understands the crime rates in Randolph to be particularly low, especially in light of her Residents in Washington D.C. and Colchester and Burlington. And Colchester and Burlington, uh, and so she wants to know why there's a uh, consideration of expanding the district. Anyone on the committee want to respond? <laughs> sure, I'd love to, Chris. <laughs> so um, the committee was set up. Because there was closer to your mouth. What's your real name? <laughs> so the committee got a charge from the select board to look at what policing should look like in Randolph. We had long term, well, not long term, but for a few years, contracted with Orange County Sheriff for services through, and there were different levels of service in the district and then throughout the town. So when that service ended it became a question of what does the what should the police department look like and what should the services look like so when we look at what services are provided by a police department it's not necessarily just crimes that you would read in the newspaper so there's a variety of other things that take place in those you know unfortunately they take place in almost every town and there's no limits you know they don't see boundaries so they're going to increase the, 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 the I think you got an increase statewide in, in, in uh, types and and uh, the amounts. So I think it's just a, it was a chance for us to sit back, take a look. <coughs> what do we need? Where do we need it? And uh, what are the options to get it? Um, being fresh here, you probably don't know the whole history of this either. We had a police department um, that was dissolved in 
2018. 2018, thank you. I wasn't sure of the year. Um, then um, we contact the Orange County Sheriff's Department for our policing. Uh, well, they canceled our contract in January um, because they didn't have enough staff to fulfill it anymore. So that left us with no policing in Randolph at all, which came into us recreating the Randolph PD within the village district, and then there's tax questions too. So we can only tax folks inside the district for that service. It's complicated. And so that's what, um, so we went from having a contract with Orange County Sheriff's Department to that being canceled, and that's where we're at right now. So we were able to pass a one-year budget to get a small force happening, and now we need to figure out what next year's gonna bring. I, I, I just only ask, like, one of the, another thing that's living here is that we're just expensive. We've gotta allow other people uh, time to talk, okay. opportunities to talk. Yeah. Okay. And, and I will say, there's a comment from the moderator, re-examining or periodic examining of government services is all, all, often or always healthy. Other questions? Comments? Yes. Um, so since you guys have you are Julia Zimmerman. Thank you. Since you guys have been looking into what uh, policing should look like in Randolph and what it does look like in Randolph, what are some solid, tangible benefits that having the police have brought us? The question is, please name some solid, tangible benefits that having the police have brought the community. Is that a well stated? Well, I can tell you right now, one of the things that really alarmed me was what we heard from the business community and the amount of drug trafficking that is going on in Randolph, um, that where they need police to respond to that. We also heard from Safeline, and Randolph is the highest utilizer in Orange County of their domestic violence services. And they need, they let us know they need police to do everything from serving restraining orders to um, responding to felony in process domestic violence crimes. The other piece of this I think that kind of ties in is the change that I think the whole country is going through with policing uh, staffing shortages, which is what we've seen uh, across the state, actually, not just with our own barracks here, but with police really having trouble uh, recruiting and keeping people at a, at keeping their staffing levels at a point where they can um, provide that sort of safety aspect that is required. And so the, it's really the safety piece. We heard from Clara Martin Center about their needs to have police present when they are responding to some crisis calls because of the need to have somebody there who is skilled in providing that safety aspect where uh, like a crisis worker would not be able to respond by themselves without the benefit of having knowing that there was somebody with the skills uh, to sort of back them up and be there in case they needed them. Uh, we, I mean, just on and on, we heard from the from Shaw's, from the uh, number of times that they have a need to call for police right now is, um, it, it sounded to us like it was uh, just about daily um, for various things that happen in the store and out in the parking lot at Shaw's, for example. So it's really, I mean, what I heard was about the, uh, every, mostly about safety aspects of keeping our community safe but also just the very high um, opioid use and the, the sort of downhill effects of that that are having on our community here, right here in Randolph. Anybody else wanna? I, I, would say, <clears throat> I would say something. Sometimes I don't know if the citizenry under, see any benefit from having police, but for example, um, the, the traffic coming down by the high, the, by Gifford by the hospital is set at 25 miles an hour. And people pretty much follow that. If there were no police, you'd have cars going down there 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. So there is a, a value to having police. So those are, those are uh, not particularly tangible answers, especially the hypothetical. Um, I'm looking for numbers, maybe things went down, things went up, or people 
were saved. They had a needed Narcan. They some like solid examples, specific cases. We we heard all of that. Hmm. So the data on the calls that the Randolph PD make are posted each each month. They're out there, and you'll so you'll see them. I think they've been on front page forum or on the Randolph PD Facebook page. Uh, and so that'll give you the number, like the calls. You're you're not going to get specifics on the cases. We didn't get that either. What we got were the types of calls, the number of them, the time. In some cases, we didn't get either um, of how long it takes to respond. I think what we're seeing overall is an increase in more of the what they call the effect crimes from opioids, the thefts the burglaries, breaking and entering, those type of things. Uh, there are cases where the PD have to respond along with the paramedics for an overdose. Uh, we heard in detail about a response that just happened to have a retired physician that came along to uh, help out with somebody who had overdosed. And the PD responded, did their portion, and then the paramedics and Gifford took it from there. So. I think the data is out there, and if that's what, if you want more data than that, reach out and we can get you that too. Susan, having a police department. I think having a police department in the in the current district is is very tangible. It, it's our business, it's our business community. I think there's there's a need for that. Our business community actually pays some of the highest taxes in the town and, and deserve that piece of piece of the, the pie, if you will. However, outside of the district, I think there's challenges of what level of policing is needed outside of the district. I think I think I think that's an important thing to to understand. And it's a difficult thing for all of us on this committee, and I'll speak for me, for me on the committee, it's a difficult thing to say, should it be expanded? I live outside of the district. And, and, and what level of service do, do, do we really need outside, outside of it? But we also heard from the mine and the difficulties that they do have right there on the Route 89 corridor. We also did hear from Shaw's and the difficulty they have with a bank in the parking lot. So, so, I, so I think it's important that we all look at it and that's why we've invited the community in to get your perspective as well. Thank you. Um, the one other thing I'll say is we can, it, there's, data is hard too because we went back and forth between the PD, Sheriff's Department PD, so there is like some bumps in the whole data issue, so, um, but like we've been saying, it's not really, some of it's hypothetical too, but we can look at communities that are neighboring us who are struggling with a lot of things too which could give us some hints at what happens when there is no PD in those communities and how they're struggling right now. Um, and I mean, Chelsea Select Board had a special meeting the other night about their lack of policing and what they want to do about that too. So we're not the only community struggling with it. Susan. I'm Susan Montgomery Grout. Um, I would mainly comment, this is a lot of data for us to digest, and I had asked for the options to be published ahead of time because I have a whole lot of questions and only allowed one. Um, there's no period indicated on the data that's gathered. I did go up on the website. There's only data from 2023. Oh, they wanted to know it. No. <clears throat> the map is um, helpful, but it's really hard to read on the handout. I think the cost should be inclusive of everything, including the vehicles. We need to know all in what the budget is forecasted. Um, the 15%, I don't know, you said 50, something about 15% on health, 21% on retirement. Those, that number seems super high to me, uh, but I don't have the breakdown there. Um, I think that the spreadsheets with the data need to be provided. I think all of this information needs to get out into the hands of the public, including property taxpayers that may not live here full time, 
when you can get a tax bill to those property tax owners <coughs> and a notice that there's an assessment coming through, I think that this information can also be delivered. Also, I want to thank you for your um, service because I know this can't be an easy thing and it's a lot of your spare time. So I do appreciate your um, time on it. If I can summarize the comment, and I'll do the last one first. It was a, a, an expression of thanks and gratitude to the committee for all the work they did. But uh, Susan was asking that the data be more widely disseminated uh, during this process. She was commenting that it wasn't widely enough disseminated uh, before tonight to be able to focus and analyze the questions. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, it's just the, the detail in here is exactly what I was looking for ahead of the meeting so that I could prepare my questions more thoughtfully and, and, and it doesn't really give us time to digest it. And hopefully there'll be more than one public forum. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nan Gwen. Nan Gwen. Um, I appreciate the fact that there is a local police department I don't really understand the boundaries of their present service area. However, I'd like to say that out in the sticks where many of us live, um, we have coverage by the Vermont State Police. Um, they can't come this minute sometimes, but they always come. And so we're talking about significant amounts of money here. And the COPS grant, as far as I can tell, is a grant, and grants are hypotheticals. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the second option, this is leading up to the second option, which expands the district up 66 and out route the, the um, Pleasant Street the second option, who would pay for that? That's well, the question. If, if I can respond briefly, the taxpayers within the boundaries of a district pay for the police district budget uh, with other, other revenues, as Trevor pointed out. And so what's the other revenue? I'm curious. Well, there was, uh, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna pass it to, to uh, Trevor. <laughs> So the other revenue you saw in there, the 87000 is everything from traffic enforcement, speed enforcement. We've made quite a bit of money off fingerprinting. For example, having an operating machine, people need prints for volunteer employment, those types of things. Records reproduction, so it's a mixed bag of those things. Uh, and that grant revenue show, would show up in that other category as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I speak to that a little? <coughs> no, right out, Joe. I can do without the mic. Um, I, I think that revenue is a question, and it's something that the committee itself hasn't delved in other areas of revenue. Um, one thing that I have a feel of is that our schools, our schools have a need for police. There's no doubt about it. Um, Scott does a great job in, 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 in trying to keep up with the difficulties of the school. <laughs> But every year the school has roughly over the last 10 years a million dollars in surpluses that they send to different accounts. So that, that, that being said, last year they had $1.7 million, but I think a bit of that was pandemic money. But they average around a million dollars a year, yet they don't have a resource officer, which would take some of the strain off of, off of, of what uh, Scott is doing. Another thing that we haven't looked into it, and I'm not sure if the select board is going to push it that way, um, but we haven't looked at what a local options tax. What's dri what drives people to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the village in itself or to the current police district? Generally, it's business. It's, you know, we've heard from the businesses. So generally, it's business that do that. Have we, have we looked at, at, at what probably close to 20 towns and cities have done in Vermont with local options tax? To, to allow that one cent on a dollar. I'm not thinking that people are going to drive all the way to Lebanon if they have to spend a penny a penny more on a, do, on a, on a dollar at today's gas prices uh, to, to, 
to, to do that. So I think there are, there are opportunities for the select board to actually look into what revenues are there to help that out. Thank you. Um, in talking about contract of services, we can't contract services if we don't have a PD. And so we can't contract with the schools, we can't contract with local communities if we don't have a PD. So keeping that in mind too. So we're very good about uh, limiting discussions from the floor, but I'm going to have to get my committee to not pass it. Pam. Yeah. <laughs> Pam Overstrom, I live um, in the um, village and have for 46 years and have never used the police department. <laughs> but um, I think our businesses need police. They need the support to have, if we want to have businesses, we need to have, provide that. If we're going to have schools, we have to. But I would like to see Randolph be Randolph, that everybody contributes to that. Mm -hmm. That it shouldn't just be me paying for a service I've never used in 46 years. It should be that we come together as a town and say, policing is important because we have a community we need to support. I don't know what the level of that needs to be, but it needs to be fair and equitable for everybody, not just for the village. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how, I've happily paid it for 46 years, and I'll do it again, but um, I'm just saying that I think there's a bigger question here about Randolph being a community and coming together and saying, yes, we need to have protection for our schools, for our businesses, and for, you know, it's, I bet you everybody here that's a homeowner has um, fire insurance. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody that doesn't have fire insurance on their house or their property? Well, that's what you're paying for. We may, I may never need a police officer, but you pay for your fire insurance because there might be a time when somebody even out in the boondocks needs help, and I want them to be able to get it. So whether it's, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Remember, even though you don't call the police department, doesn't mean you've never used oh, no, it. No, no, <laughs> I, I totally say that we, yeah, I support it, and I support a police department like Scott that are kind and fair and that's what we want. We don't want um, um, a powerful police department that does not listen and we need to be connected with mental health. There's so many more issues in our world today. It's not a simple move into town because it's safe. You've got to um, take all the things that are happening and um, weigh them out, but let's be a community. I'm hoping everyone hears that because I'm not going to be able to summarize it all. <laughs> Mr. Terry. Yes, hi. Uh, Andrew Terry. Um, I would like to know, I guess, Kristen mentioned initially a uh, comparison to the various towns um, and what they spend on policing services and why that wasn't included in the presentation. It's been passed to Trevor. <laughs> there, there were 16 different examples, including us, so 15 others. Um, we can break this data down. We use it to inform the budgeting process. It's um, got a number of metrics in there. The average police budget from the benchmarks, about 998,000. 910 was the median for that. I'm looking for comparisons uh, based on population size and, and the amount of money we're spending and also the crime rate. I think Randolph has a relatively low crime rate. And when you compare the size of the village population to uh, the town population, the village population is relatively small. Um, and it compares favorably to a lot of town sizes that don't have any police coverage at all. But when you, can, when you expand the population to include the whole town, then we're, you know, we're looking at uh, significantly more people that could support the services. Um, I want everyone to be aware, I've been researching this for probably the last nine months or so, and I cannot find another town left in Vermont that still has a police services district. Uh, there used to be over 40 different local police districts throughout the, the state of Vermont. And I've contacted every town I can find, and uh, except for Woodstock, which has kind of an unusual arrangement, but uh, even there, they still, they have coverage outside the police district. I don't want to get into the specifics of that, but from what I can tell, Randolph is the only town left that still has a local police district. And what Pam was saying is, you know, we all live here. We all use the hospitals, we all use the schools. 
we all presumably shop downtown as much as we can. Now, you know, if we had a local options tax like Joe was suggesting, well, I live in the village. So that means that not only am I paying higher property taxes, but then I'm also going to pay a higher sales tax on top of that just because, you know, people in, in Randolph Center don't want to pay for this. I mean, um, the other thing is that the police district was enacted almost 100, over 100 years ago. That's when Route 66 was a dirt road, you know? Going to Randolph Center was like a big deal. <laughs> I mean, and certainly going to East Randolph, I mean, that would take like half a day. So this, you know, the, the keeping the services localized made a lot of sense back then because that's where all the, the business and the people were. I mean, once you got out of the, the local village district, you know, you'd go for miles. It, it was really farms, and it's not that way anymore. You know, we, we, we don't uh, we don't have uh, horse and buggies, and you can get to East Randolph in, like, what, eight minutes. Well, so, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Terry, you said one thing I just want to remind everybody of, and that is, well, you said we may have a low crime rate. The reality is our police respond to a lot more than just crime. And that's the kind of proactive policing that we have, that we want to get to, that we have in our current chief, um, who's very good at it, and just, for example, just like shows up at uh, the concerts at Gifford, for example, just to cruise through and make sure everybody's well, having a good time. That's fine. But, but it, there's it, so many things that, other things, other than crime, that we right now rely on police for. Also, just so everybody's aware, if we were to not have a police department, we would be the only town in, in Vermont with a hospital that did not have a police department. We all live here. We all contribute. Excuse me. Anyone else that hasn't spoken yet? Yes. Um, when you talked about the expanded services and then contracting out to other towns, oh, I'm Kathleen Mason. I live in the village of Randolph. Um, when you talked about contracting out to try and uh, raise some more revenue, um, how would that work? Because if they're responding to calls outside contracted, would that detract from their ability to, with the same staffing level, to be able to respond within our regular district? I was just looking for a cost to benefit ratio of uh, revenue, um, gaining revenue versus uh, stretching the force uh, uh, with a larger area to serve. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Everyone hear the question? Essentially, it was looking for a cost-benefit analysis, any data to see whether uh, contracting services with other municipalities or entities would drive the costs up or whether it would help. Uh, I'm going to guess that uh, the study committee hasn't gotten that detail because we don't have any contracting partners yet. We don't, but what I can tell you is that many of the Can calls right now... Many, many, some of the calls now take our existing police force out of the village. They're going to Braintree, they're going to Brookfield, they're going to Bethel, they're going to Royalton on some of these calls already. So, you know, the, the thought is, is there a, a capacity there to get paid for these services versus us absorbing the cost of them? Thank you, I believe you were next. So I'm Kim Anderson and I'm not from here. I'm from Brookfield and I would love it if we were expanded into your jurisdiction. Um, but I am asking the question because I work for the Orange County Restorative Justice Center and so we work with all of your criminals. And um, I'm interested in knowing um, what the cost benefit is with the social worker and since it wasn't included in the budget pieces, I'm just wondering if you've looked at that and um, how, how that comes out. Does, is it a money-saving um, addition, or have you looked into that piece? The question is whether there's been any data gathered on a cost-benefit for embedded social work. Is that a fair summary? We haven't done the cost-benefit analysis, but we know that um, all the other towns that have an embedded mental health worker in their police department, so that's uh, Springfield, Bellows Falls, Hartford, Brattleboro, uh, Windsor, Rutland, Montpelier and Barrie, 
uh, Morrisville just started a week ago. Um, I'm probably leaving a couple out. Um, that the mental health agency pays their salary. What we considered was offering to, to sort of, um, uh, if we're going to go that route, to, to work into the budget um, a very small amount to, um, what, not, not a matching amount, but a very small amount to uh, help out with a potential of hiring somebody who could be used in a lot of different ways uh, in a, a full-time capacity in the, working for the town. Does that make sense? Not, not maybe not primarily just mental health calls, but other things like you know, my bike got stolen. Like you may not need a police officer for that, but you might need some emotional support or somebody to at least take a report. You know, it could be a, it could run the gamut of things. And I've seen that in all these other towns, they use their social workers. Uh, really depends on what the community needs are. Thank you. Do you not want us to pass this? Oh. Okay with it? Um, when <clears throat> when we first got going, we realized that we were kind of starting from scratch because in last spring, the sheriff's department that had been contracting the police department here was gone, and we didn't have any money. And they they found enough money to hire a chief and. Um, an administrator and we're working from ground zero really even to get to a, um, a district and on top of that we were trying to <clears throat> wrestle with what police services were needed and we we could only think in terms of so much Passing it around. sorry Gator um, but just an add-on, if we were able to do mental health, that's where the contracts could also come in. So maybe Randolph itself doesn't need a full-time, but we could contract with Branch Brookfield, that sort of thing. So just, uh, once again, this is all draft and, yeah. Do we have some people from the... Well, just on the, there is $10,000 in each of those models for contracted services for the embedded social worker program at this point. So there so is money. in each of those models there was ten thousand dollars for <laughs> contracted services. Did I get that correct? Tom. Tom Hardy, been here fifty years. Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. No problem, Reverend Hardy. Yeah, no problem. So um, I think that I, I thank the committee. They've done mm. yeoman's work over the last few months and I just pushed a pencil around. Some of the things that I think it would help the questions that people have are, for instance, the efficiencies. Um, I, I, I don't know the household numbers off the top of my head, but the per capita numbers with going from the current to a townwide would go from $570 per person to 267. 50% savings, if you will. The cost per road mile of patrol would go from 428,000 miles, square, square mile, to 2,000, and the uh, cost per mile of road patrol would go from 107,000 per mile to 15,000 per mile. I mean, it just makes such sense when you look at it that we are a town, Dan is absolutely right, and it benefits everybody. So those numbers put together by household, per person, you know, per capita would, would really help, I think, answer people's questions. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I just respond to that, Peter, just quickly? Sure. So, Tom, um, when we look at budgeting, we don't charge a fee per person, right? Our, our revenues, the way the state of Vermont is set up, come from property taxes. So all we can give you is what that impact is. Like, where's the money coming from? The money's not coming from a per capita or per mile charge. So I get what you're saying, and it does... You know, I can work the numbers game and skew them according to data sets also, but the the mileage of roads in town, maybe less miles with more people, more businesses, whatnot in it. But when you look at the, there's more calls probably in that area because of those things. So it's easy to throw numbers out there, 
but we don't do any of our budgeting or any of our planning or any of that according to finances coming in on a per capita or per mile, other than our no, allocation we do it of in our funding. Own budgets in our households. Well, you can do that, but we can't get money by a per capita basis. We no, can't but you get explain it that way. Well, instead of skewing it the other way. Like her tangible, tangible Tom, sorry, I'm sorry. Tom's Joe Bosey, and we know each other. Um, that's not particularly relevant to me, to be quite honest. We can use numbers. We can use numbers in different ways. It's absolutely relevant. There's a person on the select board that has 1.35 million dollars in property in town. Looks to save 2,700 dollars on their taxes by going to a townwide system. However, there's others that may live in a trailer house that, that somehow, because they have enough property, have 250000 of, of value, and they're who never have a problem, no one's stealing from their barn, who are going to be asked to pay $640. Again, we're in, a in, An increase. I understand what you've said. I have heard that more than once. Okay. Uh, however, being a town, not all services are equitable. Let me explain to you why. Do they run the, do they run the water pipe up? to South Randolph Road. They don't. So are we looking to be equitable with water? Do they run the sewer pipe to East Randolph? They don't. Up here in Randolph Center, they get a swing set actually bought by the college down the town where people can walk and go to a huge recreation area. Is there any thought of actually being equitable in providing busing across the town so every kid has a chance? So to say equity, I challenge that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any of the virtual? Can I please just say what's up? No, we have to let everyone have a chance to speak first. Yes, Lieutenant. I've got to go. Okay. And thank you for inviting me. Um, if you guys need me to come back for any other forum or committee, I would be happy to. Uh, I would just say consider uh, the state of the Vermont State Police currently, uh, which we are in a very challenging time with our staffing and our coverage is minimal at this point in time so uh, we're doing what we can we will show up um, but it would take a lot of time we can't be present well thank, thank you for joining us thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. yes ken ken goss i live outside the village area and I just want to make a comment, kind of my opinion, but it's not only my opinion. There's a lot of others outside the village that feel the way I do. We haven't had the need for police up to this point. So we feel that we really do not need it now. So I don't know why we're going through this. Because we, it's, our taxes would increase significantly, and there's no need for it. We don't want it or need it. Just a comment. Thank you, Ken. I'm going to ask David, and then I'm going to go to the virtuals. Uh, yeah, David Palmer. Uh, I lived in Randolph the same 46 years that Pam has. <laughs> uh, comment and a question. Uh, first, a comment. Uh, uh, thank the committee for the impressive body of work that you put forth tonight. Also, uh, you've been on a very ambitious meeting schedule, 10 meetings in four months. You really had your pull up pedal to keep this forward. So uh, that, that's terrific. Um, uh, Brookfield's been mentioned, uh, and I guess clarify an assumption I have. Uh, and it's also been mentioned that the Randolph PD has responded to calls in Brookfield, Grange Street, that helps. My assumption is uh, if a call goes into 911, uh, it's answering with a dysfunctional Orange County Sheriff's Department and the stress on the state police, that in fact the Randolph PD uh, probably uh, receives calls you know, from Grange Street, Brookfield. Uh, has the committee had any initial first preliminary contact with those select boards? Uh, this was a topic at the town meeting to look at uh, a, a three town system. Uh, does any, any contact happen that way? Uh, and just to conclude, uh, the uh, Trevor mentioned there's $100,000 in the budget uh, that, as I understand from a town meeting, actually comes from the general fund. Uh, and that's to cover out of village services. Uh, that the parts of Randolph that aren't now covered, uh, range from Brookfield. And as a resident of the village, uh, not only do I pay the uh, first and least district tax, but then I'm paying, uh, paying the general fund that's also covering the out of town service. 
Uh, so I guess I'd, I'd like a little discussion on uh, out-of-town service and in fact, is the Randolph PD uh, a 911 default to handle calls and for field creatures? I will summarize what I understand three points. Is Randolph PD a default on 911 calls? Has there been any outreach to Braintree, Brookfield, or other towns to see about sharing? And the uh, 100,000 general fund. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Judy. She hasn't been heard from yet. <laughs> I think I can answer your question about the 911 calls. Um, I also work for a police agency, uh, not in the town of Randolph, um, so I'm somewhat familiar with uh, police calls and 911 calls. There are a certain number of 911, they're called PSAP centers in the state of Vermont. So if you dial 911, it doesn't matter where you're standing, it's going to go to one of those PSAPs. The 911 operator that answers the call will send it to the appropriate agency. Um, when we talk about Randolph PD having responded to calls that are outside the district, um, it's for a few different reasons. They either responded to assist the Vermont State Police or maybe security at VTC. Um, they uh, were doing Governor's Highway Safety Patrol, so they were maybe running radar on Route 66 or the Ridge Road or the East Bethel Road or wherever, and um, maybe they stopped somebody that there was a warrant for, so they arrested them. So that's considered a call outside the district, but they were on Governor's Highway Safety grant money while they were doing it. Um, and the third reason that they might respond outside the district um, is if the Vermont State Police ask them to, because they can't get there in time or they can't get there at all, and the call needs to be handled now. Um, so they will call Randolph PD and ask them if they can take it um, instead. Quick follow-up, so it does occur. And relative to the PSAP answering the 911 call, uh, wherever in the state that's being answered, the answering party is going to know Randolph as the police department and uh, likely would refer a 911 call from Brookfield or Braintree to the Randolph Police Department. No, they would refer a call from Braintree or Brookfield to the Vermont State Police Barracks in Royalton because that's who is your police agency. And then they might refer it to Randolph. Right. Correct. So it can happen. Um, I can't speak to um, the other towns talking about police services. I don't know if anyone here on the board can or not. <laughs> Is a training question? Stephanie, <laughs> you're part of it <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> so the conversation the committee has been having has only been around services in Randolph. We have not reached out to the other towns because we don't know what we're reaching out with. So we kind of got to understand where we're at and where the town wants to go with this and then reach out to them on. There have been some inquiries from members of their boards about what we're doing not from the perspective of hey we want to jump in and help you guys with this but from the hey what are you up to type thing so i understand that we're having technical difficulties with the virtual uh participants so we're going to continue and i believe you've been in the queue for a while so please go ahead um <clears throat> excuse me i'm matt morosky i've been in randolph about 20 years um living outside the district and inside the district as well um and I support having a, a townwide police force. I was expecting to see, I figured there'd be some economy of scale with that, <coughs> that uh, folks, if we expanded to townwide, um, on average, everybody would pay less than just the folks in the village are paying right now. And Trevor, I'm hoping you can put that slide back up that has tax rates and impacts on it. And, and, and am I right? Is there some economy of scale? I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm quite saying if there's not an economy of scale, well, why not? Well, the difference is the volume and the number of what you need. So we know right now that the budget that's in play this year is not enough to cover even just the district, and that's your comparable. So when you look yeah. at going town-wide and what you need, you know, you, you look at, you know, I would question even that the budget that's there for town-wide is, is enough if you're going town-wide. I think that number is low, um, but you're you're not there because you're you're very low right now. But we're very low right now. But I was looking at the FY25 numbers, which I think included an extra. If you're look, you're comparing the. Oh, so, I mean, the, the number of, of officers. This <laughs> no, this is, this is the answer. To the budget numbers. That's the answer. It's the number okay. of people. Okay. Yeah. 
when you look at your main number in yep. that budget, it's labor hours. Yeah, full-time officers is the difference between. Yes. Um, I I have a I guess I want to comment on people keep saying. Name, Ruiz. please. Oh, right, Alejandro Ruiz. <clears throat> okay. Uh, people keep commenting that we're. I want to respond to that. We're all one community. Uh, I agree. Um, but there's sort of an assumption there about like the value of the police, and to me, in the time I've lived outside the village, the only times I've felt unsafe have actually been caused directly by the police, including one time there was a speed chase down my road, Crocker Road, they were chasing a PT Cruiser. They went, I, I could have been running there, they're going like 50 something miles an hour down a dirt road. Um, I've also had some other experiences that I've shared with the select board uh, that I don't really want to get into um, publicly. So, you know, I just want to think we should keep that in mind. So when I see a budget for a million dollars to spend on the police, which is something that to me, it looks like money I'm just spending to make my life more dangerous, not less dangerous. Um, and when, when I compare that to, you know, my sister's a teacher, and she buys her own equipment still, right? She buys her supplies. Um, just doesn't look like money well spent to me. So just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. He was saying that uh, he lives outside the district. I'm sorry. He lives outside the district. The only time he has really felt unsafe where he lives was caused by a police cruiser that was apparently in a chase and went by him at a high rate of speed. He was also indicating that he, is, he has a member of his family who's a school teacher that has to purchase supplies out of her own pocket for her programs. He was, one, he was commenting that he thought maybe additional tax dollars would be better spent on school supplies. Did I get that correctly? Beautifully. Okay. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, Michael Larry, uh, out of the district. I'm wide open to looking at this with an open mind. But with all this law enforcement business, we've got to look at sentencing. We hear, see it all the time on the news. So and so got arrested. Last week they got arrested. Six months ago they got arrested. Until we address this sentencing thing, and I'm sure any officer here will agree, what's it for? These guys know it's a joke. They get pulled over, whatever they do, they're back out on the street. So unless there's some real sentencing changes, boy, not only Randolph, but the whole country's got a bad problem. Thank you. I think Mike was saying that uh, it's a much bigger problem than just expanding the police district and that the criminal justice system needs, needs work too. Big time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Never thought I'd be speaking. I'm just going to say that. Um, my name is Kathy Robbins, and I've lived in this town for over 50, um, a long time. Um, and uh, I've raised <clears throat> children, many, many children in this town um, with, like, Pam's children, right? And so I'm a bit, um, this budget thing is, like, way beyond a lot of my scope. I pay taxes on a house I've lived on. I uh, have owned a house in Randolph in two different locations many, many years. Um, if, I'm curious about a more historical perspective. At what point did the town, um, again, growing up in Randolph, we always had a police department, and then there was transition to Orange County for whatever reason. And so at what point did we stop respecting that that is uh, an appropriate resource. I mean, we have a hospital sitting here. If we have doctors who walk out, nurses who walk out, um, I'm curious about how people would respond to that. Like, there's no safety net there. And yet, where's the ambulance going to go? And I thought about that, too, with the ambulance. Like, you know, where are the ambulances located? It used to be located, again, decades ago, on the Beanville Road, if anybody remembers the little uh, place. Um, I see Pam recognize that. So a little place, right? And But it expanded and now it's much further from the town um, and we share that resource. So I, again, my, I'm just curious, like, when did the town or people believe that we needed to stop having a police department? I think that's the part for me I miss, I don't understand. Because we always had it for years. We paid for a police station, uh, a community for years. But it, what was the, the like year or timeline when we there was a belief that well we don't need this anymore? Well, let me 
That was a lot. Let me step out, of, step out of my seat as moderator and yeah. give you a little historical perspective yeah. uh, from someone who is a village trustee for the village of Randolph yeah. when the village of Randolph merged with the town of Randolph and he became a select board member. Yeah. So in, after the original fires in downtown Randolph back in the 1800s, the village of Randolph incorporated as a separate municipality. And over time, that village of Randolph had a, its own fire department, its own highway department, its own police department. And in the, uh, over the years, there was a lot of discussion, but in 1982 and 83, there was a big work to merge the village and the town because there was duplicate spending. And in that merger, uh, and it was partly political, that the police district was created with the same boundaries as the village because the village wanted to maintain police and the town people didn't want it. So that gives you what happened back then. That's how we have a separate police district within the town. It was the survivor of the old village of Randolph. Now, after that, I want to be a moderator and I'll pass the mic to someone else. <laughs> and, again, and I think that makes it sort of a good point. You know, like, I'm curious how many people here would support, like, not having a fire department anymore either. Like, does anybody think that a fire department is a valuable service? Again, Pam, like, maybe you never use it, thank God. Um, but by the same token, ha not having a, that support when you need it, you know, um, and, you know, I think it's wonderful for people who maybe have never been a victim of, say, I don't know, domestic violence and sort of, you know, not needed it, but I'd be hard pressed to believe anybody hasn't, doesn't know somebody, right, or has not seen a crime. Um, and I just, it, it sort of boggles my mind that, that we even have to sort of have a conversation. Um, so my understanding is your, your comment is that we have fire services, uh, ambulance services, other services that are town-wide, and the police services are restricted to an area. Okay. I don't have to answer that. Right? <laughs> that was a comment for everyone to yeah. consider. Yeah. I would make a quick comment on that. I'm... You know, this old man has trouble walking I up his land. <laughs> Thank you for your comment, though. Um, I've lived here all my life, born here, grew up here, and I always remember a police too, and I always felt safe and secure, and I live in the village. But one of the things that was eye-opening for me is that I dispatched for two years at Montpelier Police Department, and I can totally say half the, more than half, probably 75% of what happens in a town or a city or wherever never hits the paper. And people can, Scott could be called out on a call and it could take, and he would think it's an easy call and all of a sudden it's going to be all night long. And none of us can have a crystal ball to find out. But the one thing I know is our world has changed and I think as a group it's been a pleasure to work with everyone that loves this community to make it come together. And have a focus of safety and a police station that's invested in the community. So I appreciate every one of you that's come out tonight and all your comments. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, it was no, good. Absolutely. If we had to pay for a fire department, I'm like, yeah. would people shut that down? Yeah. Any I'm more comments, people. questions, suggestions? Am I allowed to go with them? Well, I haven't been allowing that, but I haven't seen anyone who hasn't gone yet jump up, so I'm going to let you go first, and then, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Amanda Porter. Um, a lot of talk has been about licensed um, social workers, and while that may be great, um, the average salary for a social worker in Vermont is $91,000. I think that's probably a lot more than what the top police are being paid in this particular town. So it may be great, but um, it would cost us even more money and not be able to do all the things that the police can do as well. Um, my question is, why is there missed opportunities for revenue? And I bring this up because I tried to bring it up before and was shot down. But Mount Tabor is one of the three towns that collected 
uh, more revenue uh, along with two others from ticketing, basically enforcing the laws, uh, than all of the other communities in Vermont. Twenty, these three towns collected 25% of all the tickets. Boy. Mount Tabor was a one was a one person police force, and more than paid for the entire department, generating more than two hundred thousand dollars in revenue. My thought is we could do that, and then when he's not busy, he could be doing something else. <laughs> and so there are missed opportunities. I think it's great that they're collecting revenue on fingerprinting, but I'm sure that it doesn't come anywhere close to that kind of revenue. My one comment and on Mount Tabor is Route 7 is straight and wide and well, well paved through Mount Tabor, which has two buildings. <laughs> well, and so I'm, I'm sure well, that's I live right on Route 66 at the very last part of the village, and I can tell you that nobody, or very seldom, do people do the 25 miles an hour through there. Yeah. I'm going to ask the chief a question because I'm not aware of this. Back when I was working, the fines collected by the court, traffic fines collected by the court, did not go to the town unless the violation was a town ordinance as opposed to a state. And even then, only a small percentage. Is that correct? Is that still correct? That is still correct. Okay. So I, I can't speak to the other towns, but, but stopping and ticketing people for violation of a municipal ordinance still doesn't get 100% of the fine back to the town. You're absolutely right, sir. It doesn't. And I'm not talking about the entire funds. I'm talking about what the town is able to retain. <coughs> Thank you. Can I, can I speak yes. You're absolutely right. Um, part of ticket fines do come back to the municipality. Um, it is a very small part. Um, also, the amount of motor vehicle stops and motor vehicle enforcement that a department can do depends on the amount of staff that they have, obviously. Um, if they are short staffed, like Randolph is now, uh, they're pretty busy jumping from call to call to call to call. There's not a lot of time to just sit there and run radar. Um, it also, a lot of people don't understand, it's a pretty fine line uh, that police officers have to walk as far as looking like uh, a tyrant or a member of the community. Could they stop people for going two miles an hour over the speed limit? They could. They're probably not going to, the majority of them, and you people wouldn't like it if they did do that. Um, so yes, is there money to be had? Absolutely there is. Uh, the agency that I work for is currently shorthanded, has been shorthanded for several years. When it was at full staff and operating very smoothly and having officers that had time to go out there and run radar, the maximum revenue that we ever brought in in a year was $18,000 on tickets. So, yep, it's money, but it's not a lot of money. Can I add to this? Oh, can I speak to this? In the 1970s, I was an over-the-road trucker. And during the 1940s and 50s, U.S. Route 301, which was the old route that people used to go down south before I-95, particularly in Virginia and in Georgia, they had these small towns that um, raised their total revenue by traffic fines, and they would ticket, they would um, target the people from up north going down south. And it became a terrible, terrible scandal. And the police would find, someone told me, for example, the police chief would stand with his foot over the, um, the curbing and they'd stop people because said they were um, running a um, walk sign. Yeah, and, and that sort of thing, and it became a scandal. And I would hate to see Randolph try to get into that. Now, I do understand what you're saying, but I would hope that we would not use that as a, um, to solve our budget issues. 
I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. And I also don't think that, you know, collecting tickets that way is, it's not a safety issue as far as I'm concerned. What's important to me is the drugs and the, the kids in the school and how the school is going and that's what I worry about. And that's where I hope our money is, is going towards and domestic violence. May I summarize it by saying that and she you, oh, and thank you for yeah. everybody. That she does not want uh, the police department or the policing services to look at traffic tickets as a revenue uh, source. She wants the efforts to go into drug enforcement, school, and issue in the schools and, and public health and that. She would prefer that. Did I get it fairly correct? Okay. Can I comment on the ticket? Anyone who hasn't spoken yet? Sue. Well, I am um, Raymond Randolph, uh, Sue Jacobs. And um, and I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor, and I do not make $91,000. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, I must be in the wrong field. But anyway, um, my comment is on credit to the, the Randolph Police Department over the years. I raised my kids here. Some of them were hellions. And yes, the police would bring them home and say, oh, there's been a party. And so let us remember what the police do for our youth in this community behind closed doors. Because I am a mother of children that has been helped by the police department. And I'm so grateful. And maybe that's why I have four living adult children today, and not one that is dead. Because I have seen my kids with drug problems. I have seen them in issues with the law, whether it was putting sugar in somebody's gas tank, breaking off emblems off cars, because it was a big deal at one time in Randolph. See how many, many kids could break off the emblem? Hey, it wasn't just working class people. It was a lot of kids out there <laughs> that were struggling with identity. Let us not forget that. Let's not um, forget how important role modeling of police departments to our youth and to those that, um, and to the parents that need support. Because I've been there. And yes, I'm a counselor now, and I am working with youth. And some of those youth are at risk. And I also do help people adults that are struggling in many areas and some things um, with the law. And yes, I have gone to court and yes, I have been to do a lot of things to help people, but I don't do it alone. I do it with the support of community. I do it with the support of the people that are, are willing to step up and walk alongside each other, and I, I just don't want to take, the, you know, forget to take the uh, attention away from what it is that, you know, when they say there's a lot of underlying things that you don't know, I'm going to tell you, you don't know, but it is happening, and so I just want to give a big thanks to over the years, my kids are all in their 40s now. You don't look a day over 39. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, thank you, Peter, for saying that. But hey, I just wanted to comment the, the positiveness of what we can do working together. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet? Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to go around second. I have Milo. You're next in the queue. And then Andy third. I'll try to keep track. <laughs> yep. Oh, I was just going to clarify a little bit on um, the comment about Mount Tabor. So no. Mount, Mount Tabor only has 260 people in it. 
and Route 7 runs through it, and you get a ton of out-of-state traffic. So, sure, it's perfect to write a municipal law and make a ton of money writing tickets, but that's not Randolph. Thank you. Um, I, I said I couldn't see the economy of scale here. It's because I literally could not see the numbers, but I've stared at them now, and I want to just <laughs> clarify. It's clear to me, um, even with the increase from four officers to eight officers, the, the rate goes down and rounding here for about uh, 25 cents per $100 um, under the existing level, this for FY25. Um, it drops from, I'm oh, sorry, from 50, roughly 50 cents per um, $100 to 25. Even with the adding officers, there's tremendous economy of scale. It gets cheaper for everybody, except in the people who like out in the outside the district. Um, but but uh, we're providing services for everybody at roughly half the cost um, that, that the people in the current district would expect to spend next year. Mike, is that, isn't that what I'm seeing there? Grand list value factors in. So the district has a smaller grand list. Yeah. The expanded it, district, so the number you divide to be raised by taxes grows yeah. as you step out. Yeah, so the folks rate in the district, decrease. so if we keep under option one, folks in the district next year who have, have a $250,000 house are going to spend about 1200 bucks. Um, people outside the district obviously will spend zero. But if we go to the option three, the townwide, the folks in the district, instead of spending 1200 bucks a year, are going to spend 600 and everybody outside the district is going to spend 600 back. Yeah, that's that great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that doesn't include Seems like Because your grandest number goes from yeah. one and a half <coughs> to four and a half based on the number. So I think those are really positive numbers. Mm -hmm. in the, in the, I think the, the comment was that... Uh, you have, don't have capital in that. Right. So yeah. you've got a, a no building which we believe will be at least three million. Yeah, that's yeah. going to have to be built. So and you also have a fair number of vehicles. So the comment generally was looking at the numbers in the, in the handout, uh, going to townwide cuts the tax burden in half, but as Trini said, those numbers don't include the capital, initial capital cost of uh, expanded district. It only cuts the tax burden in half for the existing district. Yeah, to the existing, the existing rate payers. It adds a burden yeah. to the rest of the town. Yeah. I think I had Mr. Terry next in the line. Yeah, I just wanted to preface this by saying um, I, I want to thank the committee for all the work they've done. I know they've put in a lot of time on this, and it's definitely appreciated. Um, and I'm not picking on them when I ask this next question. Uh, I thought there was data that you studied in terms of the number of calls inside the district versus outside the district, and, and I'm wondering why that wasn't included in the presentation. In other words, if 90% if of the calls are coming from within the village versus 10% everywhere else, you know, then that makes it uh, a lot more, I guess, uh, in, focused in the village as compared to if it was 50-50, then, you know, that seems to uh, indicate the, the village should be expanded. Any uh, police services committee response to the data or lack of data on inside district and outside district calls? So Joe looks like he wants the mic. Um, we, we looked at, as, as someone has stated, we looked, at a, we looked at a lot of the numbers both inside the district and outside the district. We looked at the calls, we looked at what the, what the state police calls that they've actually responded to out, outside of the district as well as those at the Randolph Police Department have done outside of the district. I can't tell you uh, and, 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 and honestly tell you that you know there are more calls in the district, more calls outside the district because the number, the data isn't exactly where we need it to be. A lot of the calls from the state police happen on Route 89 but within Randolph borders, you know, such as traffic stops, those, those type of things. So we, we can't be really honest and say, well, this is the percentage, but there is a certain feel outside the district, at least uh, those, those that, I, that I that I talk with, um, that the, is the level of policing needed outside the district at the same level that's needed inside the district, and you know, and and the feel that I get, I can't say that it, it, you know it's not data. Yeah, it's, I'm I, talking but, feeling, not data. But but, but 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 what I can say is that a fair share of folks outside the district don't feel they need the police maybe as much. There's also a lot of large landowners 
there are the, still the farms that are out there that don't have the hay bale stone, that don't have cow tipping happening. You know, so there's, there's a lot. So part of it is, is what level is really needed outside the district versus inside the district. And can you, can you put a budget together there that captures that? So why should it not be based on data instead of feelings? Because you don't have the data available you to look at data, it. where is it? Well, we look at data, but can you, I can't tell you that the state police are providing Every that this one actually happened on Route 89, or that this one happened in the I guess my point is why isn't the data made available to us? You guys looked at it, but we can't see it. I think the response was the data is unreliable. Okay, you are next, man. <laughs> oh. I'm not actually raising my hand. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, some of, some of it is, is um, you know, it's kind of hard to tell, especially the state police stuff. Uh, they don't differentiate between the village and the and the in the town side um, we started doing that inside on our own um, and so that data if you want to look at the call rates um, we did look at it we maybe we didn't count every single thing um, and put it in the presentation but it is available um, and also there are some ambiguous like sometimes it says route 66 that could be village or town side. Um, and we've got a lot of calls at the school, for example, where kids from outside the village are coming into the village, so forth. So even once you break down the data, it's still not a complete clear picture. But I can well. look at it? You can look at it. Yeah, it's available on, I think, on the town website, on the Facebook page for the village, um, Randall, okay. Beattie. Um, yep. Departments, police, police stats, yep. posted at the end of each month. Yep. They break them down into categories, and the reports show you okay. violation location. Excellent. Thank you. The, the only thing I was going to add, to some extent, it's not comparing apples to apples. There are calls that your local police department will respond to that the state police won't. Um, you know, my guess is if Randolph PD gets a call about a barking dog, they probably go and take care of it as a noise complainer, at least trying to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. no, BSP is not coming ACL. for that. So there's not going to be a call generated for it. So that's a very small percentage of it. But all of the data is absolutely available. Yeah. It's public information. We've looked at it. You can contact BSP. You can contact Randolph. You can look on the town's website. It's there. Okay. Sorry. That was one of the reasons, too, that we looked at that middle option of expanding the district mm -hmm. because of the activity down by Shaw's and the growth that's happening up by the barn. So that was that middle option. So you made a good point. Some of it, like Joe said, isn't out in the outlying areas, but we are changing. Just going back to enforcing... Reintroduce yourself, please. Amanda Porter. Just okay. going back to enforcing the laws that are already out there. Um, no disrespect, but there were a lot of extreme situations that were brought up. And I'm not talking about extremes. I'm talking about people doing 40 and a 25. And about the only place that people seem to regularly obey the speed limit is directly on Main Street. Um, even through the hospital area, I think most people tend to do the speed limit. But from the four-way stop down to Ayers Brook uh, on 66 or Central Street, people are flying. And if you don't think that that's a safety issue, you're mistaken. Pedestrians are out. Kids are out. Dogs are out. Whatever. And while everyone should be watching out for themselves, if people were going 25, it would make things a whole lot safer for everybody that lives and travels through there. So it's not just about generating income. What I'm saying is, is that we could attack a safety issue and generate income. It's a missed opportunity. I'm not saying just go out to generate but let's make our town a little bit safer and more enjoyable for those of us that live there. I do, in fact, agree with you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It was just, just the, the other issue of being petty about traffic tickets, but I do agree with you totally about keeping the town safe. 
I would say at this point it's a staffing issue. We have two officers on, and so they have been doing some what they can, but they're called all the time. All the time, Amanda. Yeah. And that's, I understand that, and that's what I'm saying. If you generate the income, it can solve that problem. Now you can pay for an officer. Well, when you're talking about another small town locally that made $18,000 in a year off of fines, that is not paying for an officer or their time. So it's not it's not viable that we can actually hire a full-time officer just for speeding in that one area. And that's also state highway, so I'm not sure how that would factor in to the fines coming back. Thank you. Dan Gwynn. Um, I am Nan Gwynn, and I just want to say, in fairness, I hope that the select board, even though I know that under the Articles of Merger, they can decide which way to go with the police district, I hope that it will show up on the ballot, on the Australian ballot at town meeting. I hope that's what they will decide. Nan says she hopes that if there's any question to be resolved to show up on an Australian ballot item at town meeting. I, I, I agree that it's, a, Nan, that it's an Australian ballot. I think it should be a separate ballot. I think it should be a separate ballot, and the, and the select board has the authority to allow that to be a separate ballot for those people outside the district so they can say what they want to have versus those people in the district. That's what I think should happen. I think it should be fair enough to say, hey, you know, I live outside the district. I'm not sure that I would vote for expanding that. However, if all the people outside the district decided that that's what they wanted to do, then that's, then, 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 that, that, that's what the select board should do. I don't think it should be that one town-wide vote and taxes are foisted upon those outside the district, while others are, are, are getting a tax, you know, a, a lesser tax. I think it's only only fair. Milo. So I think in talking about fairness, I think the other thing to consider. I mean, we're outside the district. I don't. Not that nobody wants their taxes to go up. However, if you live outside the district and you go shopping at Shaw's and somebody breaks into your car. Do you want a sticker on your car saying, I live outside the district, the police don't have to do anything about this. If somebody assaults you while you're in town, can you say, oh, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to let it ride because I live outside the district. I mean, essentially, we, have, we do have a district that is paying for the police, and people outside the district use those police while they're in town without paying into it. Comments, questions? Oh, yes. I had you in the queue, didn't I? I'm sorry. Kathleen Mason. I'm wondering if there could be a fourth model. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't don't look at me with daggers. <laughs> <laughs> um, that looks at the scope of practice that our police are asked to uh, engage in, and are they're engaging in so many more mental health type calls, and that's beyond what the original intent of a police officer is. Can we look at reducing their scope of practice and then perhaps adding in more social um, and uh, mental health workers uh, to take over that, that part of their position. So we can have police officers do police officer work and mental health professionals do uh, the work uh, alongside and support that social need. Everybody get the question or the comment? Could we redefine the scope of services of police so that it cuts, if I'm getting this correctly, you want to cut the social work part out of the police scope of services and have that as standing separately? I'd like to reimagine the whole framework, yeah. Okay. Comments on that? Just, Steph, you'll get on that. Sure thing. <laughs> Kristen, I think you should comment on that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go with you again. I just wanted to support. He's reintroduced himself. Alejandro Ruiz. I just wanted. I thought that was a really good line of questioning, especially with the. Um, at the beginning, we talked about how uh, police in the whole country is having stashing issues. Like it seems like this institution is becoming unsustainable, in general, and this is not a unique to Randolph problem, but maybe we can have unique to Randolph solutions. I think that's a really good question to ask to start going down that path. And you know, I live outside the district. I would be so happy to contribute to those sorts of services in the way that I'm not happy to contribute to police services. Um, just like I contribute to schools and don't ever plan on having children. It's something I'm happy to pay for. 
Let me step outside my moderator hat for just a moment <laughs> and remind people that in the early to mid-1980s, after the separate police district was established, there was a move to extend the police district south from the village south to the Bethel Line so that it would take in the Beanville Road, Route 12 South properties. And the argument for that was primarily that that's where we have zone for all of our commercial development. How are we going to attract commercial development if we don't provide police services? And that's, I'm just throwing this out as, as a thought. And now we see also Route 66 is getting that. So that was, that was a proposal that met with defeat at the ballot box, but uh, I see it coming back. So now I'll shut up my historical perspective and see if there are any more questions. Yes, Judy, or comments. Is she going to ask me a question? Is she going to comment on <laughs> No, I'm going to comment on the, the mental health aspect that you brought up. Um, there probably isn't a law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont that doesn't agree with you. Um, they are definitely handling issues that are not their job. Um, but right now, they don't have any choice. They don't have any options. And in particular, we don't have any options here because as Kristen stated in the slideshow, uh, the Royalton Barracks is the only barracks in the state of Vermont without an embedded social worker, um, which if they had one, that might be something we can share. Um, the position is there. There is a vacancy for that position paid for. It's just nobody's in it. Nobody's applied for it. Nobody's taken the job. Um, it, I believe, is paid for by Claire Martin. Is that correct, Kristen, and the Department of Health? Department of Mental Health. Department of Mental Health. It, well, it's an MOU between the right. Department of Public Safety and right. the Department of Mental Health. Um, yeah. You know, we, we discussed this in our meeting and, uh, meetings, and as a show of good faith, we were willing to kick in more money, even I think ten thousand dollars we talked about, you know, townwide. But the position is there; it's it's just not filled, and it is filled almost everywhere else in the state of Vermont. And although they can't, they can't completely take away all of those calls from the police officers. They certainly can assist them, and there are calls that they can handle instead. Um, it, it will definitely free up police officer time if that service was available. I also like to just say, if you haven't met our chief, you should meet him because um, he is exactly what you want in a police officer and being a chief of police. It's not police brutality and trying to get you like 100% under his leadership. We are going to have, we're going to have a really positive case very well deserved the pauses. Um, so if you have not met our chief, please meet him. Um, that is his philosophy, 100%, is trying to be in the community, in our schools helping, trying to meet people, trying to be there. Um, the problem is staffing. We can't, we can't just magically make people appear to take those positions, but that's the direction we want to go, and the direction our chief will take it. Tom? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Tom Ayers is a select board member, and we're here to listen tonight, but I just want to make one observation. What Stephanie just talked about, which these folks have talked about, which my lovely neighbor Kathleen has talked about, is the essence of the difference between proactive and reactive policing. And that's what the future of policing in Randolph needs to be, is proactive whether it's in the village, whether it's in an expanded district, whether it's in the whole town, we need to re-envision what policing is. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. That's right. I think Sue is next in my queue, and I'll you. Okay, I just want to make a comment on um, mental health and working together with the police force. I've done that when I first came into the field of mental health up in the Northeast Kingdom, and worked with for two years, two and a half years on front line with the police and working with the prison system um, and helping people find a better way than, um, than breaking the law or being in a position of um, trying to take their lives. One of the things we have to remember is mental health therapists are just as much on the line for being hurt and being shot down 
as police officers are. And I have been in the emergency room with someone coming at me to hurt me, and I was thankful that the police were there because there was no way I was going to be able to fight them off. So we definitely have to work together to make make it make it a, our community better. And I, I just wanted to say that because you folks have all read in the past few years where social workers have lost their lives. Mental health counselors have been on the front line for abuse. And we walk every day wondering when someone's going to get upset at us. And it's pretty scary. And I, for one, am glad that I can reach out and call and say, hey, life's happening here and I need help. And so I just wanted to put that out as a comment. Thank you. I'm Vicki Richardson. I live here in Randolph. I'm just curious, with Royalton being the only place that isn't able to get somebody, after 35 years in HR, I, I just have to ask the question, <laughs> where are they trying to find people? How far out are they, are, are they going to, to look for one? Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Vicki, I can answer that, um, <laughs> because I'm involved in that in my work. Um, they, they've really been thinking outside the box. In fact, I talked to Lieutenant Parton before he left about right now he's got all his troopers uh, actually asking people if they're interested in applying for the job. It has to be the right fit. Right. It can't just be anybody. Right. But So they have had a few people apply. The salary is not $91,000, but it is, um, it's also you can make a lot more money in the private sector, frankly, and so a lot of social workers are going that way or go working in hospitals as opposed to this. Um, it is a unique position and it's perfect for the right person. Um, they are, they've expanded it beyond the Claire Martin's uh, purview to HCRS, which is the Mental Health Agency Healthcare Rehabilitation Services in Wyndham and Windsor counties. They've offered, Claire Martin has uh, said to HCRS, you know, please can you find somebody to fill our barracks because they sometimes cover the HCRS catchment area down in Wilder and a little edge of Windsor County. Uh, HCRS has been unable to fill it. They've filled uh, six or seven other towns within their jurisdiction with their employees, but they haven't been able to fill this one. Some thinks it's because Royalton is sort of um, in the boonies. Uh, that the only thing near it is McCullough's, but you know you can get a good sandwich at McCullough's. So <laughs> I think that's a draw. Um, but so we there is some thought from Claire Martin that if we were to have somebody in Randolph. We're actually more of a happening place and more more things going on than at the barracks, and so it may be more attractive to somebody. This is really an opportunity for us, and that's what I have said all along is when we talk about reimagining policing, this is our opportunity right now to really think outside the box and see what other types of services we want to be able to provide from our town. Thank you. I'll yeah. just say that we've had some great role models. I'm thinking of Phil Malika, um, Tom Peterson, <coughs> that used to walk the blocks downtown. They knew everybody. They didn't carry weapons. Maybe times have changed, so they might have, to. maybe that would help. But we need to make policing friendly and helpful and not um, threatening. Um, we definitely want the proactive. A bicycle cop again? Yeah. yeah <laughs> whatever. But, <laughs> Don't. I can come back to the take all day to get to East Randolph. Just real quickly, does the committee intend to make a recommendation at some point? Or? No. The committee's job is to take, this is to take in. Tonight we're here to listen and get input from folks. Mm -hmm. and, you know, are we on the right path? Are these the only options? We heard another one, which is kind of what we've kind of had that discussion of what the mental health piece looks like. So we're kind of in there, but we're not defined as a separate option. But yes, the job of the committee is to make a recommendation to the select board. Okay, thank you.
I want to personally thank all of you for attending tonight and uh, for tolerating me. Uh, this is the end of the comments section of the Police Service Committee and Select Board meeting. So I'm going to pass the mic back to the chair and let her go. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. You heard there's a variety of sites out there where there's some more data. Um, this committee's job is not over, so those meetings will be out there advertised. Um, our next meeting will probably be one of our liveliest discussions, so if you like lively public meetings, <laughs> that's one to, to, to put on the record. You know, we joke for many years that people don't come out usually to public events um, so it's a great turnout today uh, the two ways to get them there is food or to misadvertise as you're doing something you're not really doing that people are going to hate and come out to but we didn't have to do that so that's all good We're so, yeah. so at this point um, we're going to draw this to an end um, and thank everybody for coming out and entertain a motion from a select board member to so suck it to adjourn. There we go. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Everybody have a safe Aye. trip. Aye.